Hi, this is Linda Rex with Our Life in the Trinity. Welcome to our gathering today. We're going to cover uh, Matthew 2, 13 to 23. I'll start by reading it in the New American Standard Bible. We'll have a prayer. Uh, we'll talk about our topic for today. And we'll have communion together. We'll end in a benediction. It's hard to believe that it's a New Year's Day this Sunday, and we're going to be looking on into 2023. And as we look forward, sometimes we can look forward with a little bit of apprehension, can't we? But our story today, I think, kind of talks about that a little bit. And let's take a look at it. Matthew 2, 13 to 23 goes like this. Now when they had gone, uh, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. And he's talking here about the wise men from the east had come to visit Jesus and his family. So when they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother while it was still night, and left for Egypt, and he remained there until the death of Herod. And this was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Then when Herod saw that he'd been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. Then what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they were no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and came to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Then after being warned by God in a dream, he left for the regions of Galilee and came and lived in a city called Nazareth. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. Let's take a moment for prayer. Then we'll start to talk about what we're going to talk about today. Heavenly Father, we're thankful that we go through life in the reality of a participation in what you're doing in this world. We are not off on our own. Even though we live like orphans, a lot of times we're still your children. We pray today that we can see more clearly what it means that you have not abandoned us. You have not left us alone, but we're included in what you are doing. And we thank you that it's all through Jesus, our Lord, and by your spirit. Amen. And then it all changed. Hmm. You, ever, you ever thought about... <clears throat> Any of the memories from when you were little? I, I, some people say they can remember what it's like to be a two-year-old. Things that happened to them when they were two years old. I really don't have any memories like that. Um, maybe, maybe you do. I don't know. Maybe there were good ones. Maybe there were bad ones. You know, the story we're reading about today, the first part, is when Jesus was still an infant about two years old, probably a toddler. And by that time, he and his family were living in a house in Bethlehem still. We don't know whether uh, his father, Joseph, had finally got some work and was able to do some carpentry work there or what had happened, but they had moved from not having a place to live to living in a home. And while they're there, they are visited by these magi or wise men from the east who had somehow discovered that uh, there was a king being born 
in Israel. Now the problem is, it created some complications here, is when they came, they went to Jerusalem first to try and find the child that was born. They spoke with King Herod, which was a mistake, because King Herod said to them, um, I'd really like to see this child. So he inquired with all of his counselors, and they told him this child would be born in Bethlehem. So he told the Magi, go to Bethlehem, find the child, and then come back and tell me where he is, so I can worship him too. Well, ostensibly he was going to go worship him, but in reality, Herod was a very cruel person. He killed, he even killed his children and his wives, and he was not a nice person. So it would have meant nothing to him to kill this child. And so we see in the story that the Magi somehow are warned by God not to go back to Jerusalem, but to take a long way home, which they did. And that night that they left, Joseph had a dream too. And the angel of the Lord says to him, you need to get your family out of here and go to Egypt. Which is where um, Jews would go to escape Roman oppression. They would flee to Egypt. So Joseph follows the instructions and immediately um, Herod sends, when he figures out he got, you know, gypped by these magi and they didn't come back. He goes, he sends a force to Bethlehem that killed every child two years younger. Can you imagine if you were living there and you had a little child, innocent children, just murdered, massacred, because King Herod was terrified about someone maybe possibly taking his power away from him. And it, I don't know, you know, Joseph and Mary are in Egypt and what it, you know, can you imagine how they felt when they heard the stories that came out of Bethlehem from their friends and so on of what happened after they left. But Joseph is interesting in this story that Joseph has pretty much adopted Jesus. He's become a father to this child. And he drops everything to keep him safe. Amazing. He just drops everything. He goes to Egypt. He suffers personal loss in order to care for Jesus. And then we see these random events happening. But these random events are not just random. They're fulfillment of scripture. God knew what was going to happen to his son, Jesus. He knew that, that it was possible for a king like Herod to massacre all the children in a small town simply because one of them could possibly be the Messiah. So, you know, God gives us as human beings freedom to choose. And our choices often create complications for us, difficulties for us, suffering for us, suffering for others, complications for others. Our choices have impact, that impacts that filter out to others, to our world around us. So we don't make choices in a vacuum. They always impact someone somewhere, somehow, and us. But they don't keep God from ultimately fulfilling his purpose and his plan. God had a plan with regards to Jesus and nothing was going to get in the way of him fulfilling what needed to be fulfilled. Our cho poor choices, they created not a, a lot of issues for us, but, but not for God. He's got it. The massacre of those infants, tragic, sad, sick, but very 
unfortunately, human seems to be that's the kind of stuff we do to ourselves and each other. But it was simply a foretaste of what Jesus was going to experience on the cross. These young people, infants, participated in Christ's own shedding of blood on the cross. And the good news is, in Christ, in his resurrection, each child rises again. There's, there's hope in the midst of this tragic story. But he allows them to be a part of God's story. You know, the reality is, as human beings, that tears, sadness, grief, suffering, terror, horror, are all a part of our story. A good story, one that captures our imagination, keeps our attention, has tension between good and evil, between light and darkness. And in our story, as a part of God's story, what brings us joy, peace, and hope in the middle of the darkness where evil stands against good is is simply the incarnation of Jesus Christ. The fact that God comes into the midst of our darkness, our brokenness, our weakness, our sin, our shame. He comes into the middle of all this, takes on our human flesh. Not as some great... Um, powerful leader, some glorious, majestic Roman Caesar. No, he comes as a, an infant, a child, a toddler, an innocent human who needs to be protected by his parents and cared for by his parents. How interesting that God, who is greater than all, humbles himself to this place so that once and for all he can eradicate evil from our human flesh. So we see Jesus throughout his human life here on earth. He is step by step forging into our humanity our ability and capacity for our desire for a right relationship with God and other people. He forges this within us, a new nature, a new way of being. Praise God. He aligns our hum broken, sinful human flesh with God's purposes and God's plans, what God wants done and how he wants things to be. He gets involved in that. That is what matters most to him. And the thing is, we need to remember, you know, stuff happens. This world's a messy place. It's a horrible place sometimes. But no matter how dark things get in our world, Jesus brings light. The parasitic efforts of evil, and that's all they are. They only feed on what is good. They wouldn't exist if there wasn't good to feed upon, they're parasitic and they will ultimately fail. We know the end of the story and it is promised us in the resurrection. You know, throughout his human life in the incarnation of Christ, and we're still in the Christmas season, there's 12 days from Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, 12 days, those 12 days were still in the Christmas season and we're considering the incarnation, God in human flesh. And during, during Jesus' life as a human being, he experienced the crucifixion of his, of his flesh in more ways than just simply on the cross. Constantly he was having to deal with his flesh and the pulls of the flesh and what it meant to be a person in human flesh living among other 
human persons. You know, in this story, we see where Jesus became the one who lived when others died. He became the one who escaped while others suffered. How many of us have had to have that experience? We think of our noble soldiers who go into war and they intend to do the right thing, but then they end up being the only one that comes home and help them to deal with that. It's hard. It's hard to see others die when they think, I should have been that person, not them. It's hard. You see, Jesus went there. He experienced that too. That was something he had to live with, the reality that those innocent children, it should have been me, but it wasn't, was it? To fulfill God's purpose and plan. You know, even though Jesus went through all these things, though, he at the same time, he's the one in whom every person suffers and dies and lives again. He is our incarnation, our life, our death, and our resurrection. So what darkness are you facing today? What battle are you fighting that you just don't seem to be able to get a handle on? What loss is so deep and so heart-wrenching that you just can't stop grieving it just the tears come what addiction are you shackled by that you can't seem to find release from does this new year look a little bleak from your vantage point considering what you're facing whatever your story is and it has significance because it's your story and it's a part of God's story. And remember, our story is, it's, it is caught up in God's story. And God's story is so much greater. And it includes every one of us. And it's not over till God says it's over. When God says it's over, it's over. And so death, you know, even death is not the end of the story anymore because of Christ, because of the incarnation, because Jesus comes, God in human flesh, takes our human flesh on, lives our life, dies our death, and rises again. It's not over till God sets it over. It's over. And he says, death is not even the end. <laughs> in some ways, it's the beginning. No, only God can do that, right? Oh, that's pretty cool. That is why, even though we have these struggles, even though we are faced with darkness and evil and everything seems to be going wrong, there is still hope, peace, joy in Christ. We're held in the midst of God's love and his grace. We are forgiven. We're accepted. We're beloved, even though it doesn't seem like we are. We are beloved. We are included in the midst of Jesus' own relationship with the Father and the Spirit. That is our joy, and that is our peace, and that is our hope. It's, it's Christ in us, the hope of glory, all because He's that little two-year-old toddler running around in Bethlehem who all of a sudden has to go to Egypt. Hmm. The comfort we have is that as we affirm the essentials of our faith, we died with Christ. We rose with Christ. We share in his glory now and forever. In the spirit, we're with him even now. And he's with us, in us. We were reminded of this as we take communion together. 
And the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he broke it. And he said, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. And he took wine and he blessed it. And he said, drink this, all of it. It's my blood shed for you. And we take this to be reminded of all Christ has done for us. And that we're right in the middle of God's story. We're included in his story. And it's not over till God says it's over, right? Let's pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you that it's not over till you say it's done. And that, Jesus, you're not going to stop until it's complete. And the Heavenly Spirit, you're at work even now, bringing the Father's purposes into perfect form. Grant us the grace to trust, to wait, to believe, through Jesus our Lord. Amen. Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. Thank you, Jesus, for offering yourself on our behalf. And Jesus also offered comfort and covenant. Thank you, Jesus. Now may our God, for whom and through whom everything exists, and the Lord Jesus Christ who shared in our humanity and shares with it, and shares in it even now, yes, by his Spirit, bless you, keep you, make his face shine on you, give you his peace. May God be with you throughout this new year bless you in every way and I hope to see you again here in our life in the Trinity. God bless you.